good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I, see, I see my excellent panelists. I don't see uh, those of you who are watching us from home or from your workplaces. I guess I should also say uh, good morning or good evening, depends on where you're sitting and where you are at this moment. But uh, this, is, uh, this is still a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be, uh, to be together to discuss uh, uh, so many important things uh, globally. Uh, we have a global conference, in this case, just, uh, just, just, just to using the opportunity uh, that, that it has been accidentally and to a large extent, of course, uh, very unfortunately been provided to us. But uh, let's, uh, as every, every, every problem has a, has, a, has a silver lining. So in this case, I guess this, this, is, this is one of those. Uh, I am honored to be the moderator. Uh, I guess uh, some of you already know me uh, from, the, from the previous sessions, from the previous lectures, from meetings in Riga, uh, trips to Brussels and Luxembourg, uh, and, uh, and, and many other things that we have experienced together in, uh, in the all the years uh, that uh, we have been doing these intensive and advanced programs at the Riga Graduate School of Law. Um, so I'm going to be moderating the panel, uh, the sustainable economic development as the cornerstone for regional stability. And uh, we will address the political importance and practicalities surrounding not only the EU's engagement with the neighboring countries, but also lessons from the EU's own experiences uh, with securing economic growth and most importantly fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the main question, is there anything that the EU can teach anyone? Uh, can we, can we, uh, is, is there something in our experiences uh, that, that uh, you can learn from? Uh, is there something which is uh, universal? Is, are, there, are there issues that we uh, would like to be uh, sharing uh, with each other, the lessons and then good practices that we would be like to be sharing with each other? Um, today, I have, I'm, I'm honored to have an excellent panel of speakers. Uh, we have an uh, Under Secretary of State, uh, Political Director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Latvia, Mr. Janis Majeks. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Majeks. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Dr. Inna Steinbuka. Uh, she's a professor at the University of Latvia and the former head of the European Commission in Latvia. Uh, Inna, nice to see you. Hello to everybody. And we, of course, have also Jürgen Klaus, uh, team lead of funding and investor relations derivatives and market intelligence at the European Stability Mechanism. Jürgen, nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, in total, we have about an hour and 15 minutes, now already a little bit less because I've been spe uh, speaking so much. But nevertheless, uh, I would kindly ask uh, each of you to, uh, to, to stick to the seven minute of uh, original intervention so that we have enough space for a discussion between ourselves. Uh, with the audience, of course, and so we are um, extremely waiting for for your questions to be uh, to be coming in, and, and 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 whatever you want to state to to the excellent panel, please use the opportunity and and, and do not uh, do not neglect this, uh, this 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 chance of addressing. I would suggest that Janis starts the discussion and draws general overview of uh, EU's economic and political relations with the uh, neighboring regions and. Uh, why our neighborhood is important uh, to us and to the European Union uh, in, in general. Janis, please. Okay, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would perhaps start with answering the question that you asked whether EU can teach anyone anything. And I was reminded of the saying that Cynic is a person who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And that is the difference with the EU, because uh, EU knows the value of growth, so it knows both the value and the price. It is both a rational actor and also it's a value-based organization. As our parliamentary secretary already mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, Latvia actively supports uh, the EU efforts in the priority countries and regions that cover the European neighborhood policy, Central Asia and the Western Balkans. The EU offers the neighbors a privileged relationship which builds on a mutual commitment of to common values, which is democracy, human rights, rule of law, good governance, market economy principles, and sustainable development. So the EU engagement is based on the values-based approach. And Latvia as a country has uh, strongly supported these values over the years, also promoting democracy, good governance, and st economic stability in our partner countries. But of course, EU is also basing its support on rational interest in having our neighborhood countries that are stable, strong, 
economically prosperous and interested in cooperating with the EU. Uh, when the EU global strategy was adopted in 2016, it came out also of the responsibility towards our own European citizens, but also responsibility towards our partners to invest in the resilience of states and societies, both to the East and the West. Uh, this strategy set out the EU core interests and principles for engaging with the wider world to promote prosperity, stability and security. Uh, and this is also exp perhaps explains uh, the interest of the EU in supporting political and structural reforms in the partner countries, as progress in these areas, progress on rule of law, progress on fighting corruption, progress on promoting democracy, is also directly linked to economical development. So within the European neighborhood policy, the EU works with 16 partner countries of uh, Eastern and, and Southern neighborhood. We as a block offer our neighbors economic integration, improved circulation of people across borders, financial assistance and technical cooperation towards approximation of EU standard. And that is perhaps one of the other answers that I can offer uh, to your question is that if EU is good with something, it's about standards, which are good basically at the end of the day to everyone, including the consumers. Uh, so, uh, this European neighborhood policy is complemented also by regional in initiatives such as Eastern Partnership. And this, I think, has been one of the big success stories of the EU, uh, because it has really managed to contribute to the growth or economic growth of the Eastern Partnership countries. The trade volume of the EU uh, with these countries has doubled over the past 10 years, for four of the countries, EU is uh, the main trading partner by now, and for the two others, it is trading partner number two. And it is also has become a significant trading partner for the EU on the EU side, because it is uh, the region as a whole is top 10 partner of the EU by now. So this cooperation has been beneficial mutually beneficial and it has also strengthened all our political ties. Uh, some of the countries have undertaken broad reforms that have indeed enabled uh, more ambitious elements of market access, that is economic integration and development through the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements or DCFTAs which uh, in the case of Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine envisage gradual economic integration into the EU internal market and offers growth opportunities for the private sector in line with European standards, which also allows healthy climate for trade and investment with our neighboring partners. And thus uh, it brings another cycle of uh, untapping the economic potential of our cooperation. And we believe that this uh, should be further supported uh, through continuation of the structural reforms and implementation of the DCFTAs. Uh, we can work more, for instance, for the SMEs. By now, uh, since 2016, more than 12,500 Georgian, Moldovan and Ukrainian SMEs have received financial support from the EU, which has created uh, some 50,000 new jobs through the EU uh, SME support programs. And other partners like Azerbaijan and Armenia support, enjoy other support from EU, which is the EU Generalized Scheme of Preferences or GSP or GSP+. Plus which remove import duties from products coming into the EU market. And so this additional export revenue, uh, GSP fosters growth in their income. And for instance, in the case of Armenia, GSP plus preferential rate use in 2018 reached 91%. So we see that this is really making some difference. Looking at Central Asia, uh, Latvia has been at the forefront of ad advancing the EU relationship with the countries of Central Asia 
And uh, the new EU strategy for Central Asia, which was mentioned uh, and which was adopted with resilience, prosperity and regional cooperation as the main objectives, it takes our relations in positive direction. Over the past few years, EU trade relations with the region have developed positively around three main aspects. One, um, work on modernization of partnership and cooperation agreements, where the countries are at different stages. Second, it's benefits provided by the EU's GSP. And finally, making progress on WTO accession for those countries that are not yet members. Uh, we believe that in conclusion of enhanced partnership and cooperation agreements will be a cornerstone of the further engagement with Central Asia and will also help uh, the trade and investment flows. Turning to Western Balkans, we believe that the EU perspective for the Western Balkans remains, remains the most powerful stabilizing force for the region because EU has lots of traction. A credible enlightened policy represents a strategic investment in Europe's security and prosperity. It may sound as a very technical progress be process because it involves um, meeting benchmarks, criteria, closing chapters, but it's not just a technical arrangement. It is also a process of moving forward with the European Union values. It is also about improving the everyday life of the people of Western Balkans and about helping them enjoy the same rights, protection and standards as EU citizens. So uh, to conclude, I would say that the EU's tailor-made approach, which responds to the different needs and interests of the partners, uh, while combined with strict conditionality, helps to develop democratic, socially equitable and inclusive societies. However, uh, long-term resilience starts from inside. So the reform ag agendas and reforms to promote the modernization uh, of the administrative systems and liberalization of economy that bring tangible results would also have a border positive effect on the whole region. So it can't be just something that is imposed by the EU, but it's, uh, these changes must develop in partnership with the countries concerned. Thank you. Yanis, thank you very much for the, uh, for the uh, very, very, very uh, um, in-depth uh, explanation of uh, so, many, so many countries, uh, so many regions, so many places. Uh, there are a couple of things which I already noted down, uh, which I loved, uh, uh, the, your, 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 what you stated, that uh, if EU is good with something, it is good with standards. Well, this is uh, this is a rather uh, rather uh, a clear message on, on on many things, and if uh, sometimes we're forgetting what the European Union is for, then it's uh, largely for setting standards both to ourselves and to everybody else. Uh, but um, there's another thing which you mentioned that Latvia is at the forefront in uh, in relations with the Central Asia, and so my question would be to you, if I may, uh, is it easy for Latvia to engage our other European Union partners, uh, partner countries, especially the Western uh, countries, in closer political and economic cooperation with Central Asian countries or also Eastern Partnership countries? Well, it depends. And I think by now it has become uh, easier. Uh, it was perhaps more difficult when we started this process uh, on uh, adv ad advocating the closer relationship with EU during our EU presidency in 2015. But by now, I think everybody has seen uh, the um, positive impact of uh, closer cooperation with Central Asia, because it is part of it is about trade, part of it is contribution to the security of the European Union as well, because, for instance, there are aspects that are related to security, such as drugs, uh, that is obviously in everybody's interest that you is engaged, but it's also about geopolitical considerations. Uh, well, it has been said that the new commission is a geopolitical uh, commission and uh, some of our engagement is also geopolitical because otherwise this region would be left with rather few partners. Uh, that would be, of course, the relationship with Russia, relationship with China, but it's almost it. So I think it is also the consideration that EU can bring uh, additional perspective 
on things and uh, perhaps also a different set of interests. So uh, to answer your question, I think that the interest of our other partners within the EU has only grown in Central Asia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yanis, once again. Uh, I will uh, immediately turn to uh, turn to Inna, uh, Dr. Inna Steinbuka, Professor Inna Steinbuka, with a with a kind uh, request to continue with a conceptual explanation how the economic effects uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic on different countries uh, is taking place and how the EU EU's experiences and solutions fighting the the pandemic maybe could be replicated outside the European Union. Inna, please, the seven minutes are yours. Thank you very much, Carly, and uh, hello to everybody again. Um, I fully agree, actually, with the um, with assumption of our sessions that uh, only a sustainable economic development should be at the cornerstone of stability in the region. However, our economic sustainability is now put at risk uh, because of the spread of the coronavirus, uh, not only in the European Union, but uh, well beyond the European borders. In the previous session, uh, Lolita Chigane um, has uh, repeatedly said that uh, uh, current spread of virus is a stress test uh, for actually for everything, for societies, for people, for uh, for. But but I would say it is um, especially big um, stress test for sustainability, for um, resilience uh, uh, of. Uh, any um, economy. Uh, and um, uh, talking about the spread of virus, I must say that unfortunately, the optimistic, uh, re relatively optimistic uh, scenarios about V type or U type recovery has not uh, materialized so far. And uh, it seems that the further development uh, will be wavy. Uh, with the uh, government uh, response, uh, uh, with, um, I mean, uh, from time to time, with the, um, um, strengthening different restrictions. And we should be ready to um, live in this world. Uh, the success of some uh, vaccine like uh, Moderna or um, uh, uh, Pfizer, yeah, it gives, of course, some hope that in uh, in a year or so, our life uh, will uh, return to to normal. However, it remains to be seen uh, how successful will be uh, the restriction on virus. Uh, and um, I must say that um, uh, um, the our economies um, was like a, like you know sick person. Uh, our economy also was COVID sick or COVID ill, and from time to time the economy was put in the artificial coma, like some of uh, sectors, uh, including tourism, including uh, uh, transport, logistics, um, and so on and so forth. However, we should look uh, at this crisis not only uh, as to a threat, but also to an opportunity. And the uh, European Union is, of course, staying shoulder to shoulder, as Commissioner said, to its member states, but also to its uh, uh, neighbor, neighbor uh, partners. Um, the uh, adoption of the next year budget and multi-annual budget for, for um, uh, in, in the European Union give um, some hope and some uh, I mean, uh, uh, some precondition for assistance, not only to the member states, but also to the partners in the neighborhood or the regions. So uh, um, it, um, it's quite clear that the European Union will provide technical assistance and will provide financial assistance if necessary uh, to its partners. However, what Everything, I think, depends not only on the EU, but on ourselves. And uh, I would say that those countries who uh, were better prepared 
uh, to meet any crisis, um, including pandemic crisis, are in a better position. What do I mean better prepared? The countries with relatively low corruption, with relatively low public debt, uh, with relatively low uh, and other fiscal and macroeconomic sustainability uh, parameters, yeah, they are, of course, in better position to borrow uh, because now it's necessary to increase the public response and accordingly uh, public uh, deficit and debt. So the, those country, countries who are better prepared than of course can borrow at the international market for lower rate and the uh, international market now are very accommodated to our needs, okay, to borrow. So this is uh, very important. For instance, I can give an example of uh, our country, Latvia. Latvia actually entered the crisis with relatively low public debt, uh, about 40%. And uh, this um, allowed our country to uh, actually uh, receive um, uh, excellent uh, rating for the um, credit, uh, rating from um, um, international credit rating uh, agencies. So, and um, the conditions under which we are borrowing and in the international markets are very, very favorable. So, well, we are EU member states, but uh, uh, on the other hand, I think uh, our example could serve as a good practice. Uh, also for our neighboring countries. Now, uh, uh, looking at the crisis uh, as uh, to an opportunity, uh, we should also think about uh, future challenges and future challenges are not only related to COVID uh, crisis and public response to it. it um, our future challenges are related to technological change uh, to the climate change, to the digital transformation. And again, the challenges are not only the European Union challenges, it's challenges to everybody. And putting these challenges into opportunity, supporting innovation, uh, supporting investment in human capital, fighting ag against corruption and introducing reforms now without wait waiting for better times. This is actually our uh, our uh, advice to our neighbors, uh, and it is also advice to ourselves about how to better how to be better prepared for for the future. I think I will stop there, and I would uh, willingly uh, answer your question, if any. Thank you, uh, Ina. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, Again, one of the quotations I'm bringing with me is definitely that uh, our economies are COVID sick, uh, COVID-19 sick. So it's not only the people who are getting sick, unfortunately, but also also the economic sectors. Um, you were you were addressing how uh, how Latvia has been uh, has been uh, uh, made eligible for uh, quite a lot of uh, money coming into the country uh, from the from the uh, borrowing that we could be could be making just for the simple reason of uh, of, of of lower uh, lower interest rates. Um, this is this is true. We have been borrowing quite a lot, but in this case, um, I, I, I have a bit of a provocative question to you. Because uh, Latvia, Latvia, as we all know, is one of the poorest uh, European Union member states. It's also one of the countries which has been spending the least on uh, on the on the healthcare sector. If we compare with many other our partners in the European Union, now at this point we have had a lot of money, but at the same time also our second wave hasn't been easy and painless, in spite of the fact that well we have that all the all the money in the economy. So is it only about the, uh, is, is it only about the uh, state having the money, or is it? a bit more about a uh, society's economic resilience. So that is, it's not only the fact that the state is providing the money, but the way the state is providing them, whom the state is providing the money, and if the state even is providing the money, does that really make a big difference? That's what I wanted to ask. Uh, well, <laughs> again, uh, you have uh, actually in one question, you raised a lot of problems. Yes. First, uh, you said now Latvia has a lot of money. It's true and it is not true because la the Latvian government is continuing, uh, uh, the, I mean, uh, it's um, permanent um, uh, conservative fiscal policy. This conservative fiscal policy has been actually started and very visible uh, after 
uh, as a response to financial crisis, and Latvia was able even to join the uh, Eurozone despite of all challenges in the very short time. So now, nowadays, the government is continues the same traditions, and that's why uh, it, it only seems, uh, maybe from outside, that uh, our debt is enormous. It is not. It is now well below 50%. And um, um, I think that um, this is a government intention not to increase the public debt enormously. It will definitely stay below 60%. And uh, depending, of course, on the spread of virus and related challenges. Now, uh, how the government uh, disseminate or allocate uh, public money to, to meet uh, COVID um, challenges uh, between economic sectors? Well, it, uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, I would say that uh, our analysis shows that actually the support reached all sectors uh, and healthcare as well and uh, and people and um, unemployment is still not high in Latvia. Uh, however, I must say that this um, public support is limited and that's why we should rely business and everything on ourselves. And our business uh, response and social response is also quite innovative. Recent survey uh, shows that uh, a lot of enterprises found innovative solutions uh, without public uh, help or with minimum help. Uh, it, um, these new solutions um, require digital transformation and, and so on, new technological solutions. Uh, also, the social society participated in so-called hackathons, uh, yeah, and uh, also offered a very innovative solution, which has been after that uh, used uh, in uh, Latvia and also beyond Latvian borders. So, I mean, uh, the response to crisis should be on both sides, from the government, from the business, and from society. We should be open, we should um, really be able to invest our uh, in intelligence, our, 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 not intelligence, our in intellect, yeah, and our knowledge into the, into the new solutions. Wonderful, Inna. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, such a, such an in-depth answer to the uh, uh, to the uh, question that I was I was stating. And it's uh, I guess you're absolutely right that it's uh, every every part of the mechanism, every part of the organism, uh, every part of the body, uh, every part of the econ economy uh, has to be has to be fighting the uh, this 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 uh, force majeure situation which we have been in for a year already uh, together so in this case we have to we have to look forward to the to the solutions um, finally uh, I would like to kindly ask uh, Jurgen uh, to explain what besides the existing economic instrumentarium that the European Union has already been providing uh, to its member states um, what has worked what hasn't worked and what of those instruments are actually good economic solutions also to the countries which are outside the European Union and outside the Eurozone as well? Please, seven minutes are yours. Yeah, thank you, Carlis, and good morning to all of you from the city of the Euro in Frankfurt, actually. So apologies for my background, the homework. So as a financial economist, of course, I'm very tempted to start the discussion with uh, maybe deepening the EMU, so European Monetary Union, uh, also using fiscal space where needed uh, we may discuss the new generation recovery fund, the just signed ESM reform, uh, maybe also Corona bonds I was recently talking about, uh, and I was mainly explaining why we don't need them. Um, we can talk about the euro bonds debate, capital market unions, and much more. But I think it's much more too technical. And I'm tempted by something else. I want to bring up something very easy and I think very important. It's we have done a lot. Uh, we don't necessarily need new instruments now. If you do too much too fast, you interact, you don't let them digest, and we actually also need to wait for them to work. But let me instead use this time here now, uh, uh, being in a, uh, in a, in a panel in, in English with different backgrounds, different cultures, uh, in all in our lingua franca English to point something utmost important to me about what is happening now in the framework with the COVID situation and maybe what we also may experience is it's about communication. 
that's my first part to your question. We need to um, have the measures understood and well communicated. Um, the EU is itself a, a very technical framework, as you all know. And I think we make it very often too technical. Sometimes even we talk a bit out of the ivory tower, which sometimes is when you look at the, the ECB and the, the very technical language, uh, it, it needs to come over much more to first also understand what we have done. Because when we understand that, we may also conclude that not necessarily always more is always better. The ECB, for example, improved this by the ECB Listens, uh, a kind of initiative which helps citizens uh, to also express in non-technical language a, a, a feeling of that it's not them and us, it's all of us in this. And I think this is very important. Also, my institution, the European Stability Mechanism, um, was literally talking about uh, a lot of our measures in our blogs in non-technical language. Also, the Commission, of course, I saw recently a great video explaining to young uh, teenagers, and this, these are the ones we also have to uh, get into this because they haven't seen prior how it was in different systems. Uh, my family comes from the former uh, East German part under times where uh, we didn't have this unification uh, which we benefit now from. So I want to stress this point by saying um, we need to communicate more about it. We need to use the different um, cultures and backgrounds to make that more prominent. But let's go to a bit of economic areas with the time I have left. So first of all, we, we call, before we say what we could do more, let's just say we did a lot. The European Union framework has taken measures unforeseen. And frankly, after 20 years in this business, I would have also signed to have never been able to be decided in size, speed, and also com comprehensiveness. So let me quickly recap that because this is maybe also something by walking the talk about communication, by the way, I try to communicate that uh, uh, each and everywhere. First of all, uh, the European stability mechanism has uh, in implemented a pandemic crisis support, 240 billion euros available uh, to help uh, COVID-19 related measures in the indirect healthcare costs related to it. We are anyway, as a ESM, we are much more of a so social mechanism than some people think. In Italy, for example, you have a lot of the stigma discussion that we are the the ones who impose measures on others. But actually our funding and uh, our support is actually helping economies to recover. It's more social and uh, ESG related, if you wish, than you wish. So yeah, and meanwhile, the European Commission also launched a lot of uh, a backstop to protect uh, the jobs in the EU. Take the 100 billion show program, uh, take the EIB 200 billion loan program, have supported uh, to all businesses in the EU. So it's not only about banks, it's not only about the sector of the society, it is about the full block of the society. And I think that's important also to flag. And by the way, the EU recovery fund, uh, this is the 750 billion um, uh, fund launched, will be issued under a social bond framework. So debt securities will be issued under a social uh, bond framework, and this is also part of uh, walking the talk. So over 1.3 trillion, 1.3 trillion uh, European response. Just to put it into context, not always new. Um, then what can countries learn from the experience, you ask? And also the combination with uh, West, which aspects, aspects could be replicated domestically before the actual membership? I came up with a, with a couple of points I want to use the last uh, one and a half, two minutes. First, um, please bear in mind, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Integration takes time. And Klaus Reckling, uh, my managing director, um, always said to me once, like, Europe needs decades to form. It is not done in months, not done in two, three years. And it needs to go to, through crisis that makes us stronger. Second. It sounds easy, doesn't work uh, topic. What does, that, what does it mean? Um, if you want to join a union, you have to think about not only what it want, wants to bring to you, but what you want to be for all of them in a the usage, which means, um, in my view, you have to basically really learn that it's more about the Batna approach, what they teach in MBA classes. So what is this? This is, you, you may recall that maybe it's the best alternative to 
a negotiated agreement to, all, to a no deal option. We see this right here and right now with the drama we call Brexit. Yeah. So you have to, it's not about what you want. Uh, it's, it's about what all want and how you can complement it. So then before I close here on also being, being conscious of time, um, you don't listen to reply, listen to understand um, in uh, the context of the EU. You have to really um, take other people's views. And also, especially as a German, I say that um, a discussion doesn't mean that someone needs to agree what others have already pre-agreed. Uh, so this is something which is a living framework. It's important to bear in mind. And also look, my last point at um, the ARM2 mechanism, we have concrete mechanisms before joining the Union, Bulgaria and Croatia took the benefit of it, used this common knowledge there uh, in the European framework to also concretely push local changes. And I may stop here and take a breath. And thank you, colleagues, for the question. Jürgen, thank you very much. Yes, uh, please, please do take a breath uh, after, after such a uh, coherent and extensive explanation of, uh, of the uh, assistance that the uh, ESM has been providing. Um, there is, of course, another quotation which I, uh, which, which, which I liked, but it's, um, it's not a sprint, it's, uh, but a marathon. The accession process is not a sprint, it's a marathon. But um, in this case, let me uh, put the question in this way. Um, would you consider the COVID-19 pandemic also to being a marathon? And how long will, would it last? Um, yeah, I, yes. And you see me a little bit hesitating because um, you recall this Rumsfeld theory of um, the known knowns, the unknown knowns and the unknown unknowns, which basically says that uh, my point that why I'm hesitating to answer is what do we actually know about this crisis? I mean, what do we really know? We haven't. We have a lot of measures now, and um, they will work. The question is, how fast and will we survive the in-between period? I.e., will there be further waves? Will there be maybe more recovery funds needed? And this is all depending on it. But to give you an answer, I think we are much faster with the vaccines on the way, and I think the 2021 will be still a tough year. But we we are trained now with it very well, and I think during the course of the next two years, these measures will kick in and we will overcome and we will also be stronger after uh, this experience. That's at least my hope and my view. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jürgen, very much uh, for, uh, for a positive message at the end that it's that we, we see the uh, light at the, uh, at, the, at, at the end and it is, uh, uh, and then it, it is, uh, it is a positive, uh, positive sign. Um, um, we have already uh, 35 more minutes left, and we already have some questions coming in from the audience uh, who, are, uh, who, are, who are posting them uh, online. Some of you maybe who have my uh, phone number, you can uh, also text them to me. Uh, I, will, I will read them out loud, but now currently I'm just being forwarded them. Um, there, is a, there is an old, um, there's a question immediately, and I want to ask, uh, the audience question is already here. Uh, there, is a, there is an interesting um, quotation, which was long time ago, almost 10 years ago, I think used by the Estonian politicians, and that has become somewhat uh, a folklore already, uh, that uh, let's not, not waste a perfectly good crisis right so in this case crisis is the moment when you can uh, you can do the adjustments you can do the uh, do the uh, shock therapy uh, for, for for very many sectors to rethink where we are at this point so the question which we have from the audience is uh, what are economic recovery predictions for the European neighborhood policy uh, sorry European neighborhood uh, countries and uh, Central Asian countries uh, post COVID can this be used as an opportunity for new updated economic reforms? So there's basically two questions. What are the predictions for the countries which are uh, Eastern Partnership and Central Asian countries, and of course, Western Balkans as well. Uh, but uh, the main, the central question is, can this be used as an opportunity? Can this situation be used as an opportunity to accelerate the reforms? Because all of you mentioned the reforms that the European Union has to be going through itself and also in relations with the, with the uh, rest of the world. But what would be your, your, your message to them, people who are asking the, uh, the question, what can we accelerate? Can we use this? How, how can we use the situation for our benefit, for a long-term sustainability? Whoever wants to go first, please. Inna, please. Well, I think I already in my um, presentation, I 
try to underline that uh, this crisis should really be used as an opportunity. Otherwise, there is no light in the end of tunnel. Um, what sort of opportunities? Um, the first, uh, digitalization and uh, remote working or telework. Uh, now we are using this conference in, uh, in a virtual manner and it works well. Uh, maybe it even increase our efficiency. Uh, we shouldn't travel. We shouldn't, you know. We can uh, you we can do a lot of things uh, almost simultaneously. So I think that this experience uh, will serve well as an example of how we can adjust. It's the same in the education. Okay, but um, this is uh, so-called very illustrative examples which we can use uh, from our own experience. Uh, but there are, of course, many other things. Uh, people will definitely uh, change their habits in all countries in the EU and beyond uh, with um, e-commerce, with um, uh, e-purchasing, internet purchasing, even in our country where this uh, uh, habit is actually not very uh, well spread uh, across different uh, uh, different ages, uh, the uh, age group of the population. Now it's uh, go. It I mean it accelerated. Now um, I would say uh, another thing which is maybe less evident. You know the COVID uh, virus also eroded um, a lot of uh, global supply chains and. Um, Regional regionalization of supply chain actually is uh, very popular now uh, among economists. This theory, and in in this sense, uh, our neighboring country can win because they can replace somebody else in this uh, regional supply chain. I mean, this can be win-win situation for for the EU and also for the neighborhood. I think I will stop there because there are many other things, but I wouldn't like to uh, to make another presentation. Okay, okay no, thank you. Uh, Yanis, Yanis, yes, please, I see you're raising your hand. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, uh, I can't speak of all the countries, uh, but uh, for instance, Eastern Partnership countries, definitely the COVID has affected the economic growth this year. But to a rather similar extent to percentage-wise as it has affected our region. So nothing really extraordinary that would uh, be strikingly different from our own development. Uh, so and the predictions, uh, at least in the OECD, is that the recovery would be roughly the, the same way also as in our region. Uh, I think it, uh, it is a very interesting question you asked about whether this could uh, support uh, further reforms as a stimulus. And uh, there I would see uh, the situation twofold. One is the, so we could call it the positive agenda, which is that perhaps this crisis uh, that has exposed in some of the partner countries uh, the inefficiencies of the medical uh, sphere, uh, the need indeed to speed up reforms in uh, this area and perhaps uh, push from the society to do more. But uh, we are looking also at a very obvious example uh, next door, uh, which is Belarus, where it was exactly the uh, almost the nonchalant attitude of Mr. Lukashenko at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis uh, that uh, basically ignored uh, the existence of um, this uh, problem uh, was one of the reasons why the Belarusians uh, voted in such lo large numbers against him. And while we are seeing this major popular demand for uh, further changes in Belarus, so... Of course, this remains to be seen how this evolves. But uh, in this sense, I think that COVID-19 has been a very strong reminder why it is also important to respond to it, not just for medical reasons, but also with respect to listening to your own population. Thank you. Thank you, Janis. Jürgen? Yeah, 
And uh, on my end, what I like about our panel here is that we can funnel in and out very nicely because I can I can talk a bit more on uh, our expectations from our economics uh, economist perspective. So, of course, I mean, global economic growth uh, is is expected to fall massively. It is nothing new in 2020. The, the question is not if. The question is how much. Uh, pro, you know, projections go between five percent, a bit lower, a bit higher. It really depends also, obviously, on many things we don't know. These are the unknown unknowns. Will the vaccines will be rolled out, uh, and how will consumer uh, function change? For example, um, e-commerce channels are rallying like crazy. So it's not like uh, people don't want to consume; they just can't consume how they did before. So don't underestimate that. Would be my uh, my my remark here. Then one point. Um, uh, you know, I brought up it was on the Next Generation Recovery Fund I mentioned earlier. What I think is important is it's called Next Generation EU, and it's important that um, we have addressed in this package also really uh, or try to address uh, everyone in the society, uh, not only a sector which maybe sometimes was a bit more the case. Last point on the way we see a recovery. Um, you know, the economists uh, we are very uh, innovative with the coming up you may have heard about the b-shaped recovery the k-shaped recovery so some countries go up already while others go lower um then there's even the square roots recovery yeah so it's, it, it never ends yeah uh, so what it means is uh, we don't know yeah we don't know uh, that's a simple way of saying it what i think and what we believe here is that indeed we will have uh, in asia and that was i think a more concrete uh, relevance of the question as well we expect China and Asia to recover faster because um, simply because of the d delay we have in the, in the progress of the um, of the pandemic. Uh, and within Europe, of course, um, uh, we will also see different recoveries from uh, countries like mine, like Germany, uh, compared to uh, take, for example, Estonia, who uh, also has now much more severe issues with it than thought or Latvia. Um, but again, my last point here do not underestimate the measures which were taken by the union. And yes, when the pressure is high in the pot, you can get things cooking. And we we need it bizarrely, sorry for saying that, but maybe if there's something good about this, maybe we need it in a way also more pressure to get some things done because we did. We did some really unique things and they will work now and we need to let them work. Thanks. Jürgen, thank you very much uh, for that. <laughs> Square root recovery. <laughs> that is uh, that is one to remember as well. Um, yeah, that's that's that, that's I guess what the European Commission is predicting that uh, this uh, this is how the recovery is going to look like uh, GDP growth wise in 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 the eurozone. But um, as we as as we currently are waiting for the for the further questions, uh, I have some of my own still prepared, and I would like to uh, exercise uh, my 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 right to to ask you those and, and, and challenge you on those. So um, going back to what uh, what Inna was saying and also Jurgen, what you were saying, I have to two of you, I have a question to elaborate a little bit more on the structural changes in the economy, in the society. What are we, what could we expect after the COVID? Meaning, are there gonna be some sectors which are gonna be transformed so that they're never gonna be the same again? Uh, are there going to be some new sectors which are going to be emerging? Will there going to be societal change that we're going to stop uh, commuting so much, but we're going to learn that uh, Zoom is still a, one, is, is, is a wonderful opportunity to, to, to be more efficient and more productive and, and not waste time while we're commuting from one place to another, but just to have a meeting and read a book uh, at home, not on, 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 on a tram or a train. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? To Yanis, I have a bit of a different question uh, because you mentioned Belarus, and uh, as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, uh, has been following closely uh, to the to the situation which is going on. It's not necessarily the question about the uh, Belarus itself, but more the question about the uh, neglect of the COVID pandemic. Would you agree if I say that uh, neglect of the COVID pandemic can serve as a as as a catalyst for political reforms? Which one of you wants to go first? There are two questions on the table, uh, two different questions on the table. It doesn't mean that Inna, Inna and, 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 and Jürgen cannot answer Janis's question and Janis cannot answer Inna's and Jürgen's question. So <laughs> whichever of you wish, wish, wishes to go first. Jürgen? Are you? Yeah, I can, of course. Yeah, I uh, see you actually, nodding. Um, I, I need somebody to yeah. speak, so. <laughs> no, please, uh, no problem, I, I, I should. Um, so 
this is of course not covering everything, but I'm I'm finally enough working on a on a paper at the moment, and this deals with one industry sector which I usually have nothing to do with, which changes dramatically, and is very interesting. Uh, uh, and this is simply uh, the whole retail and luxury goods sector. So the way we consume, talking about e-commerce. So this is something I found, um, if I refer back to the point of, is there also a chance in a crisis? Utmost is stunning. And give me, let me give you two examples. And then this, that is also my question, uh, my, my answer here, sorry. Um, uh, of course, I'm very worried about tourism as well, but let's, let's talk first on, uh, on the way we consume uh, the way we buy our things and restaurants. So what I find amazing is um, the agility and flexibility we have seen now from areas where you would say, oh my God, restaurant business, uh, this, this is it for them. We have seen people sending boxes pre-cooked. I, I had the other day from my local restaurant with a scan code when mm -hmm. you, know, you, you scan it, you, you open your box and then pops up a video telling you how to finish your meal. <laughs> so they have the turnover. They have the turnover. I have a new cooking experience. And I said, you know, guys, this is so great. I shared it with people that the guy later on said, you know, I've been as busy as prior. So just to tell you, there is much more resilience than one thing. So it's, it's not so easy to always say for each industry. And before I let my, my fellows uh, answer as well, I think more broadly saying that um, traveling is an issue because do you want to sit somewhere with a face mask where you usually sit at a nice beach and take from a buffer something to eat. But here we also see new approaches. And this is the chance in it. Distribution channels will, of course, change. But with the support provided by the union as well, it is also possible to change them. Because people may say, I want to change, but I don't have financial means. I'm a small. Well, here yeah. you go. You can, you can do that. So I stop here, leaving the floor to you now. Well, I will continue with the structural change if possible. Um, without uh, giving these very nice examples, uh, illustrative examples, I will talk about uh, general structural changes in, uh, in the economies. And I must say that definitely there will be big changes. However, uh, they will differ from country to country. I mean, the countries with more uh, diverse uh, economic structure, uh, it will be easier. And with, of course, the countries like, for instance, uh, Greece, where uh, exactly tourism sector has a very, very big share, it will be more difficult to adjust. I mean, it depends, but um, um, looking at this crisis as to an opportunity, maybe it will be another catalyst. Uh, to diversify uh, structure of the economy and also regional structure because um, I mean the regional relations uh, in, in the countries also will be will be changed not only uh, sector by sector. Uh, so it is um, a quite uh, serious uh, issue also about short term changes and long term changes because in the short term some of the sectors can be hit. Uh, like uh, you already Jürgen mentioned tourism or I don't know uh, uh, traveling but uh, or hotel business but in the long run I don't think that uh, people will uh, stop traveling or will travel only virtually I'm sure that it will return uh, but uh, this business will return but it will uh, need uh, uh, more time uh, to come back Okay. I will stop here. Okay. Uh, if uh, before before Yanis, uh, Yanis, I'm sorry. Just in, if I may, uh, a little bit of a follow-up question. It will take more time. Um, why? Because the, the uh, recovery from the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, the vaccination process is going to take longer in some countries uh, and less in some. Or not on them. No, because you see, if uh, some damages for the sector will be very deep and to recover you know from the bottom the sector will need additional investment and because you we shouldn't uh, also exclude uh, um, i mean serial bankruptcies of uh, of enterprises in some sectors it's impossible you know to start from scratch and to recover in the short run that's why it will really require time Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, what are what are your answers or answer? 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, would say that, I, in a way, I already alluded to this uh, role of COVID in the changes in uh, Belarus. Unfortunately, at this stage, we can't speak of reform because, uh, well, Mr. Lukashenko has just put it under the pressure lead by violent repression of uh, protesters. So at this stage, uh, we can't really speak of uh, reform in Belarus, but it's definitely a catalyst for change. Uh, but perhaps in I would look at it in a slightly broader uh, aspect. And that is uh, what I already mentioned in my introductory remarks, that uh, what really matters is these changes and openness and uh, good governance for the sustainability of the country as a whole because it could have been something different. It didn't have to be COVID-19. It could have been uh, something different that would be a negative, strong negative impact on the Belarusian society and which uh, then President Lukashenko could afford to ignore and which would uh, boil over uh, since there are no checks that we would have in democratic societies like checks and balances between branches of power or uh, good governance in the hospitals or uh, free media that would bring attention to the emerging problem. So this COVID-19 in this case was just one example of a big problem being ignored in an authoritarian society. And uh, I think this is why this example is relevant to the EU engagement with other uh, partners uh, that we simply need engagement with countries uh, where our support or engagement would not go down to anything or rather to nothing. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, Yanis. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question coming in, and a uh, question which is uh, actually going to be uh, we're going to be shifting away from the from the COVID pandemic. I think we, to a large extent, we have discussed all the political and economic intricacies of of of, of it. And we have a question from the audience. Um, the UK was such a large part of the EU economy. With its new role, has there been an assessment? of the impact on the European Union economic sustainability moving towards uh, 2030. Who wants to go first on the, on the uh, effects of, of, of the United Kingdom leaving the Euro European Union uh, on, 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 on uh, the uh, economic and political life of the, of the European Union? Yeah, I can I can uh, say a bit on this. I mean, there is a lot of research out and still ongoing. Uh, what we what they all consent here, uh, in, bring the consent is that of course, um, uh, from an also be it from a from a cash uh, in outflow perspective, be it from the fact that we have um, big topics with the uh, with the banking industry uh, because a lot of financial products are still settled in London. The the, the impact will be complex and severe. Um, it is, it is a bit depending on, on, I mean, you know, George Box saying all, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, it really depends on what you want to read. You find nearly everything, but the only real bottom line we have, at least from what I read, is it's going to be, it's going to be severe and it's, they're going to be also impacts um, for the chances in every crisis, also for new, um, for new tensions, of course, but also for new alliances along that. Um, I, I struggle here to come up with a with a clear number because um, I mean we have here I have a little table here in front of me where they just simply uh, matrix the different aspects in there and this explains you it's a paper from the ECB uh, by the way for those who are interested working paper number two hundred forty nine so if you want to read a bit on this uh, just Google that uh, ECB working paper and the complexity is here that it's such a complex matrix of interactions that it is really difficult to forecast apart from the fact that it's going to be severe. I don't know if my panelists have anything else on that, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be obviously a big game changer. Well, uh, I will continue. Uh, indeed, there are so many different estimates of potential impacts that it's not, uh, not worth now to discussing numbers. 
uh, even more, it's still uncertainty because ahead, because uh, only on Sunday, we will know whether the uh, trade deal between the EU and the UK will uh, happen or will not. So uh, we still have a chance uh, to conclude a deal and it will have uh, also an impact. However, I would um, uh, like to, um, to uh, recall that despite of initial concerns about multi-annual uh, framework um, uh, for 21-27, without the UK, you know, there were a lot of speculation how to bridge the gap with less uh, income without uh, one uh, big uh, member states and how to reallocate money. So the EU was very uh, successful in uh, not only bridging the gap, but bridging the gap in the very critical uh, COVID circumstances. So, and not only the budget has been uh, adopted, but also uh, recovery and resilience fund. Uh, I mean, the facility also. And uh, that means that uh, despite any estimates, and I do not believe in the very long-term estimates because everything can uh, be different uh, <laughs> in, uh, you know, in 10 years. Uh, that's why I think that the EU already demonstrated um, its uh, decisiveness and ability. To stay together shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder as, as Commissioner say, said. Okay, so we are quite successful so far. Oh, wonderful. Yanis, do you have something to add? Well, uh, not that much to add after uh, the analysis of two economists uh, for a non economist, but uh, well, just two things. One, as Ina already mentioned, I think. Uh, Gauging the impact would be only possible once we know whether there is a deal or no deal. And uh, second, also stating the obvious that irrespective of uh, where we land with the deal, uh, EU will remain an important trading partner for UK and ver vice versa. Well, we have so many links ranging from economic to human ties uh, that... Uh, the tides will be rebuilt one way or another, just that uh, it's clear that there will be an impact uh, immediately. Thank you. Um, Yanis, Yanis as, 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 as you correctly pointed out, you're not an economist among two economists. And uh, in, in this case, I will still ask the follow-up question. Therefore, I was emphasizing the political consequences. So there are two options. There is, a, there is an agreement on the future relation. There is no agreement on future relations. How the political relations could be affected in one case and in the other case? Well, it will be easier if there is an agreement. Uh, because then we will have to build uh, on on that. If there is no agreement, there will still be n continuation of the common work because irrespective of how the Brexit ends, we, for instance, nationally are very much interested in having close relationship with the UK, uh, for instance, in the security field. Uh, we will remain as uh, NATO allies. So it's just a matter of uh, the base where we will start rebuilding that relationship or building it further if there is a deal. Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's rather a matter of how. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, about 10 more minutes and then and, and we have two questions. One is from the audience, the other is, uh, the other is mine. Uh, I will I will abuse my rights as a moderator. I'm going to ask my question first uh, in order to go a bit even further. Brexit was one thing. Economic sustainability uh, for regional stability, uh, for the global stability. We have seen the 2020 and the whole decade actually has been a lot of turbulence taking place in, in, in the world politics, in the world economics, right? We have seen a lot of presidents come and go. We have seen a lot of state leaders come and go. Ideas, uh, Euroscepticism, many other things we have seen which have been, have been happening. Now, to some extent, um, we are now in entering 2021 in a rather we are taking some of the things with us. Unfortunately, COVID is coming with us. That's that's the thing which is going to be there. At the same time, we are also leaving some of the things behind. You as 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 um, not only as an expert, but also as just a, a human being living in this world. 
Uh, what are your expectations? What is your outlook? How the world will look like in the next 10 years? Economically, trade-wise in this case, uh, will, will we going to have free trade? We, have we learned that the free trade is an essential thing now, finally? Or are we going to have more uh, return to, uh, to, to uh, more restrictive, more uh, protectionist policies? And from the political angle, will we going to have this neo-sovereignism continuously um, uh, growing? Or are we going to return back more to multilateralism? And of course, as you are probably already guessing, I am somewhat nodding towards the uh, results of the uh, US presidential elections in my question. So who, who would like to go first? Uh, Inna, would you? Would you? Yes, uh, thank you, Carly. Um, uh, before Christmas, I would uh, love to say that uh, we all will be very happy and prosperous in, in the new year. But um, as an economist, um, not only as a human being, but as economists, I'm rather skeptical about, about this. Uh, it's clear that in the coming one or two years, uh, there will be divergences in uh, uh, in regional development. There will be also increasing uh, inequality, uh, and um, the rich people can become richer and the poor can become poorer because the, this was the consequences of financial crisis. Uh, and, it, and it seems to me that uh, uh, nowadays pandemic crisis will. Um, unfortunately contribute to even bigger divergence. So uh, we also will experience uh, bankruptcies, as I said, and I very much hope that uh, these pandemic economic uh, challenges uh, will not uh, have a, an impact on banking sector. Let's hope that it will be good news from, from the new year. Um, as to um, a positive news, um, of course, uh, uh, European countries will receive like the rain from the sky. This um, RRF uh, resilience and recovery resilience money and depends uh, to what extent we will all be able to allocate this money in uh, in the smart way uh, for promoting digital change, uh, green economy, but also productivity growth and prosperity. In our country so and also i mean a lot of things depends on uh, i would say a flexibility and ability to adjust to challenges of our government so public response is also crucial and what else i think that in the end of the day all governments have understood how important healthcare is for the people and um, I hope that uh, lessons learned uh, will improve uh, the uh, conditions uh, of, of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ina, very much. Uh, Jurgen, would you go? Yeah, I can add here because I want to absolutely echo your points, Ina, and then um, also say as a financial economist uh, working for a crisis mechanism, uh, it, let me just say one thing. Uh, we, we've seen the sovereign debt crisis, the euro euro crisis, some call it, I don't like the word, but um, what I want to say is we had so far only banks. It was only money. This is about life uh, and exactly what you just stated on healthcare. Those who are the uh, fire savers now, the people really need are not people like me. Um, and I think we should also get this humbleness in here. But two points on your question. Um, as a human being at the moment, and I come back to my initial note on, on information and communication, I'm afraid of what we are missing. Um, what I mean is COVID is so omnipresent in everything you read, and in, at least here, in every news you see. And I'm afraid that we may see regimes, things changing, which are now done under the surface, under this noise, which is so over everything. And I would hope that we do not let this happen. That's my fear as a human being. Uh, I'm talking about laws may be imposed, changes done which usually would have had a much wider audience and press coverage than now. The second thing is, I was when you asked the question, dear Carlis, uh, um, I was looking at a book which you, which at least in the Carlis, uh, you probably also know, maybe all of you know, uh, standing here, it's called Debt. 
It's from Mr. David Graeber, who sadly died uh, a couple of uh, months ago, I think of weeks only. Uh, it's called Debt the First 5,000 Years. And this is something I'm very worried and fascinated about at the same time. Because if you look what how we do this, what we're doing now, is we're creating something out of nothing. Um, we call this money. Uh, we call this monetary policy. Give it all funny names. And this is something I'm worried about also as a human being to close the circle. How this is going to end? How do we get out of this? And also, how will it change society going forward? Jürgen, Jürgen thank you very much for a, for a wonderful, wonderful remark. And I, I think not only as a human being, as a, as a Democrat, your, your remark on uh, that this uh, COVID, COVID no noise can actually be uh, disguising uh, something, something that is more maybe um, structurally uh, more damaging to our societies than, uh, than, than actually we could even expect. Uh, Janis, uh, again, bandwagoning on this uh, Jürgen's, Jürgen's remark about, uh, about uh, democracy and, 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 and so what is, what is your take? How the world, will the world become more uh, democratic? Uh, will the world become more multilateral? Has has they? Uh, we don't hear you, unfortunately. But I'm going to continue. Just uh, just. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm I'm back. Uh, so uh, I'm going to quote both of you. Uh, one uh, Jürgen's allusion to known unknowns and unknown unknowns, and uh, some of the unknowns that are already known uh, is that for next four years we will have a U.S. administration that has already indicated that it will uh, have more of a multilateral approach, for instance, of re-engaging with the World Health Organization. We also know uh, the unknown, uh, which is uh, the new European Commission, which has uh, stated that multilateralism will be the founding element of uh, relationship uh, with uh, United States. So two of the big players for certainly some time uh, will have this approach that will favor uh, multilateral engagement. That doesn't mean that uh, the state sovereignty will somewhat disappear. I don't think that we will get to the rosy pictures of everybody working just uh, for the greater common good. We saw this uh, even at the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, how uh, egoistic countries uh, could be. But if I have to look at this 10-year perspective, uh, then uh, I would refer revert to your quote, uh, which predates even Estonian politicians uh, that never put a go good crisis to waste, is that I think that some of the lessons will have been learned. Uh, ranging from more digital economies, because I think once people have discovered how uh, their productivity can be improved by digital means during this year, I don't think they will throw that away. But also looking at the bigger picture than EU or its cooperation partners, and here I would refer to uh, United Nations, which has the Sustainable Development Goals and is currently working uh, for their implementation, and these goals are also called 2030 Agenda, so which is exactly in 10 years' time. If we manage collectively to achieve uh, those goals, or at least uh, very much approach them, then I think we will have managed to make the world a better place by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Anis, very much. So uh, we have uh, almost no time left, but I'm going to still uh, ask the uh, final question, which is also from the audience. Uh, which is a very uh, requires actually a very short answer, uh, maybe even a one-word answer. Um, I will I will start with uh, the question, which is: uh, Do you see areas in this case that shorten it down to area of economic priority that we should focus on over the next ten years? So, what is the priority economic sector or economic policy that we should concentrate on? Uh, for the for the next ye uh, ten years, please answer it very shortly. One sentence, one word, uh, maximum two sentences. Uh, Professor Inna Steinbuk, uh, University of Latvia. I will be very concise. Uh, the economic renaissance depends on 
productivity and international competitiveness, which in turn uh, depends on technological change and digital transformation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So productivity, productivity and competitiveness. Uh, Jürgen. Uh, yeah, I come, I come from another angle, more, more, uh, more country focused because it's very close to my heart and uh, ends my sentence with the word Africa. This is where we need to look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, and uh, Janis Maszek from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia. I would uh, single out the effective functioning of the WTO. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all three of you. You have been tremendously wonderful. Jürgen Klaus, uh, European Stability Mechanism, Inner Steinbuch, uh, University of Latvia, and uh, Janis Majeks, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia. Yeah, uh, you have been uh, a, a great, great panel, excellent panel. I had high expectations, but you definitely went way over them. So I hope that the audience who was watching us also enjoyed this discussion. Uh, truly thankful for uh, for the questions that have been sent in. Uh, stay uh, tuned for the for the uh, follow up of the of the conference and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Bye.